So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here and I hope everybody's been enjoying the day's festivities. Again, my name is Aaron Battle and um, I will be monitoring uh, this today. <clears throat> so I want to start with, um, I want to start with Catherine, Catherine Soto. Um, Catherine, um, you are, despite having kidney disease since the age of two and being on dialysis since 1998, Catherine knows that there is no such thing as impossible. In addition to books, she also writes articles and, and a blog for dialysis patients who, who are going through the same struggles. She lives in, Catherine lives in Rialto, California. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to ask you, what made you choose in center hemodialysis? Well, I was really given no choice. I can't do PD, and my husband and I don't work well together, so I couldn't do home dialysis. So in center hemodialysis seemed to be the option. Now I've done it a couple of different ways. I've done um, four hours, three days a week for the first ten or twelve years. I was on dialysis while I was working as a full-time special ed teacher. And then I did nocturnal for about five years while I was still working. And then I'm now I'm being extended during the days from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m., mm -hmm. which is six hours. So you, you did, um, you did, in, you did uh, nocturnal. And what was the other one? Uh, extended hours. Oh, okay. All Instead right. of doing four hours, I'm doing six. Okay. So um, I just have a question, what does nesting mean? Nesting while you're on dialysis means, you know how birds make their nest as comfortable as possible with little cotton and little chutkies that they go find and things yes. to make their nest comfortable? Well, dialysis chair during treatment is not the most comfortable place in the world to be. So yeah. I try to make it comfortable for me. I bring hot packs with me because I'm always old. There's one of them now that I have out. I have uh -huh. a blanket. I have a mattress pad. I have my snacks and my ice over here. Okay. On the edge of the table. So basically, I make a little nest to sit in with all of my toys and all of my gadgets and everything that I need. Uh -huh. So I nest in the chair. Right. Oh, great. I love that terminology. Yes, I remember, too. I had all my stuff around me so that I would know where to get it when, when I needed it. Um, so, yeah, that's really an, an amazing um, thing. It's a good term. Um, what, um, what are some words of wisdom you would like to share with the audience? Go to your dialysis treatment, show up, do them, no matter how rotten you feel in your head. No matter how depressed you are, you need to go. Mm -hmm. You need to do your treatment. And as I always say, um, don't live to dial to dialyze, dialyze to live. Yes. And do one one happy thing, one good thing for yourself every day. Mm -hmm. So, what is that one happy thing you do for yourself? I eat dark chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably terrible, but that's one of the things that I do that makes me happy. Okay. I have All a, right. a couple pieces of dark chocolate in the evening for dessert. Mm -hmm. Very um, nice. I buy books. I'm an avid sci-fi reader. Mm -hmm. And I have a book coming out around October 14th. I have my first novel coming out. Oh, so fantastic. that's a reward to myself as being a successful writer. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. So let, you'll let us all know, um, what, what is the title? The title is Grey Dawn of Darwin, Cat's Island. Okay. Um, we'll, if you could send us the information, we'll make sure yes. people find out about it. Uh, send it out okay. to Lori and uh, to, send it to Lori. so we can, we can actually get it and look at it. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing all your information today. Um, so let's move on to, I want to go now to um, peritoneal dialysis. And we have with us today, Diane Kelly. Hi, Diane. How are you? 
Hello. Nice to see you. Welcome. Um, Diane, you. you live in Lumberton, New Jersey. You've been on, P on peritoneal dialysis for two and a half years, mm -hmm. and you've been listed for five years for mm -hmm. your transplant. Yes. Um, so um, just, I, 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 do you mind telling your diagnosis? It's um, something that I never heard of. The, uh, yeah, it's actually an autoimmune. Um, it's, I guess, similar, you know, inflammatory. I have inflammation, which has caused the irregular amyloid, which is the protein from the liver. Mm -hmm. We all have amyloids, but most of the amyloids come out and they're digested or, or if they're, you, you know, um, they go as waste. Right. Mine, the one that comes out misfolded, the body mm -hmm. doesn't recognize. It's a sticky thing and it just like kind of goes around and hence sticks to the kidneys. So mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't get diagnosed until I was 50 and I had no symptoms whatsoever. I just went for a routine mammogram. They found the lump when it wasn't cancer, then they tested it for amyloids. Okay. But yeah, so um, there's different types on AA amyloidosis. Okay. There's AL and, you know, different ones. Okay, great. Thank you so much for telling, saying that because, you know, there's a, so many things that affect the kidneys that most people don't know about. And it's always yeah. um, to, to learn something different. So um, I would like to ask you, um, <clears throat> how does your catheter feel? <laughs> It, it feels fine now. Um, I'll tell you what, the only time that I ever feel it is if I like, you know, in a hurry and I like accidentally like zip up my pants too quick. I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, I'm yeah. always aware. Um, let's just say that um, yoga pants are your best friend when you're on peritoneal because then you don't have to worry about that type of thing. But yeah. um, you know, um, I would say at the beginning, like anything else, when it's inserted, you know, you have to make sure that, that it, you clean it well and, and you have to clean it well all the time. But they say that, you know, that it's healed and it's fine because the hole where the catheter comes out looks like a, a pierced ear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not oozing or anything. It's just, right. you got to remember that it is connected to you. So, right. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember um, mine used to get in the way a lot. So yeah. <laughs> it certainly is. You have to remember, <laughs> you have to remember that it's there. It's, it's sometimes yeah. you kind of do forget if it, it's not giving you any issues and actually making sure that it uh, stays clean. Um, the other thing I'd like to ask you, do you travel and how do you travel? Um, I have not flown since I have been on PD. I okay. did do a road trip and, um, my dialysis center asked me to take my machine and everything that you'd use for, for your machine, but also just in case to bring my manuals. So, um, that means that if something happened in the machine, I would still be able to do dialysis manually. Mm -hmm. And, um, let's just say I started out with a, a small SUV and I wound up with a big minivan <laughs> because it's a lot of stuff that I traveled yeah, with. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, well, I, when I traveled, I did travel and, um, um, but I would always have boxes sent to wherever I was going. Um, yeah. so, and I had the, the, the big machine, so I couldn't carry mine with me. So at that point there was no, there, that I didn't know if there was no portable machine to carry, but I do understand that it's, uh, it's much easy. It's easy to travel while you're on peritoneal because they do, will send the supplies to wherever it is that you're going. So yeah. that's always a good thing. Yeah. In uh, fact, I know somebody that goes to, um, uh, St. Thomas every year mm -hmm. because it's the United States. She has no problem with having the stuff sent ahead of time. So she just brings the machine on and they give you something um, that the FAA or whatever, you know, pr provides. So um, it gets stored on board because something like that can't be stored with the luggage. Exactly. It's yeah. too sensitive. Yeah. And do you enjoy traveling? I love it. I actually grew up overseas. So oh. I love, yeah, anytime, anytime I could, I would, I would travel, but, you know, being so new with it and everything. I, and, and especially since, you know, COVID. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and just one more thing is um, how do you remain hopeful? Um, it is difficult. I will say, um, I think when you first start, it's also new and then you get a, you know, in a routine and, 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 and it's just like, you know, all right, it's 11 o'clock time to set up, you know, or whatever time you want to do it. Um, I, I think what winds up happening is, you know, the first year goes by like that. And the second year is when I really started to feel like, okay, now it's not that I didn't get calls. I got calls, but you know, like always a bridesmaid, never a bride, always second string, never the transplant. <laughs> so the first yeah. time my boyfriend told everybody, oh, she's going to get it. She's going to get it. Well, it didn't happen. So as I would get calls after that, I would say, don't say a word until they're wheeling me into the operation. <laughs> you know, Do not say anything because, 
yeah, it could be another situation. So, but what I feel is the fact that I'm even getting calls is so hopeful. Um, I will be honest, last year during COVID, I really didn't want to go to a hospital because I know that it was, it, this, this virus is so contagious and they have to suppress your immune system and you could get anything mm -hmm. without COVID. So right. I was actually like, you know what? The greater power is watching over me. It's not my time. Mm -hmm. So then how do you tell yourself to be patient? And, you know, I, I guess what I do is I just say, I'm very lucky to be living in 2021 where it's very easy to do peritoneal dialysis. The, the machine is computerized. Things are at your fingertips. You know, they bring the supplies to you. I mean, it's, I work a full-time job and I've been working from home, but it was totally doable when I was going into the office every day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think I'm very blessed. So yeah. I just keep gratitude in the forefront and say, you know what? It's going to happen when it's the right time to happen. Great. So Fantastic. That's, you know, but I do have a great support system with friends and family and my faith. And I, I'm, I'm involved in a lot of things. And, and I think you do. You have to keep yourself, your mind off your disease. As she said, you don't dialysize, you know, right. to live or live to yeah. dialysize, you know, yeah. you, you dialysize to live. So it's just like part of your routine. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's great. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks so much. And thank you for joining us. I appreciate oh, it. Thank you. Um, our next contestant. No, <laughs> <laughs> we have next, we have, um, we're looking now at home hemodialysis. Um, Nilja, Nilcha, Gedne, thank you so much for joining us and welcome, welcome, welcome. My pleasure to be here today. It's a great day. And um, uh, I also wanted to point out that I've actually been doing solo home dialysis from the start. So okay. uh, I just want people to understand that it is doable, uh, mm -hmm. even at my age. And uh, so I like to encourage people to look at all their options. Right. So and, and solo, solo meaning that you do it yourself, as opposed to sometimes there are partners of, um, that are Right. I oh, never had, I, I've lived alone for 30, 40 years. I can't lost count years ago. <laughs> and so when dialysis became a reality, I was like, uh, at the time there was a requirement for a care partner. And I yes. said, okay, but I'm going to learn everything. I didn't want anyone involved in my, my treatment. I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a very, it's not just being personal, but I'm also a very independent person. And as I have progressed, I also found out that if I was going to make mistakes, it's when people were around. I, I have I go into my zone and I do oh, my, yeah. my thing. So I, that's how I learned. Um, and then during the before the requirement was removed for a, a care partner, I did have someone in the home. That was the only basic stipulation. They didn't mean, you know, the requirement was never written that people had to do your treatment. Right. It was written that you had to have someone available for emergency. So I complied with that. Um, but actually it was Home Dialyzers United that went to the FDA and said, you know, you've got to get rid of this. And mm -hmm. it took us two years, but we did. <laughs> Great. Yes. And I remember right at the beginning too, that the home, uh, that was one of the requirements that you had to have a partner. Um, so, and you know what, you actually answered the question I was going to ask. And um, so what, um, how about self cannulation? How do you, how do you feel about that? And what, what were the, what were your, you know, what's your pros I gotta tell you, <laughs> when I first crashed into dialysis, which I had no intention of doing in the first place, I um, did have to do about three months in center while my fistula matured. Mm -hmm. um, and I looked around and as I watched, I was on a catheter at the time, of course, but I was watching them cannulate and it literally made me nauseous. I could not watch. I could not do it. I could not even imagine doing it. But I got to tell you also that my fierce sense of independence, you know, the first time that I was in center, I had friends arriving from France. We had a the activities planned. And I told my clinic, I said, you know, I can't do dialysis on Friday. I'll, you know, see you Monday. And they looked at me and said, you can't do that. And I'm like, hey, watch me. Because like the other people before me have said, I live to dialyze. I don't dialyze. I mean, I thought, yeah, <laughs> yes. I always get it wrong. I <laughs> dialyzed. Uh, to live. And so that was what it was important to me. And so at any rate, I knew that I was going to have to do home dialysis. Therefore, I had to learn to cannulate. Mm -hmm. And it was mind over matter. I literally dreamt it. I would imagine it. I would close my eyes and literally like do cannulation with, you know, the, the practice because 
you know, I just had to continually, you know, make myself to visualize it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the nurses gave me needles to hold and said, stick them in an orange. Later on, they gave me an arm to practice on. Um, and then finally, the big day came when I was actually going to use my fistula and got to stick that for the first time. And it, it went great. And, you know, all it took was that one time. Now, I have to say, and from that last eight years of experience, that your fistula is a moving, growing thing, and it changes over time. You know, it's and so you have to learn to love it. You have to learn to live it and, and feel it. So constant, you know what, there'll be times when it's not working and I will need to go back and, and figure out where, what, how it's moved, how it's changed. I remember what telling my uh, surgeon at one point I have, I said, I'm an old lady and my arm, it's got a little bit of old lady flab. I said, could you kind of fix that? Because my fistula started out on the top of my arm and it's now practically in my armpit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to come up with strange ways to anchor it, you know, to, to cannulate. Uh, and I tell you these things not to make you afraid, but to anybody can do it. Right. You, any and and I once you've gotten over that hump, you know, yeah. visualized it and that fear. Yeah, everything is about conquering your fear. And yeah. once you've conquered that first fear, you'll never. You, you don't feel the needle the way you you would if somebody else sticks you. I mean, I still can't have blood drawn out of my other arm without turning away and feeling nauseous. But I stick myself every day right. and don't think twice about it. So. It, you know, and your fistula is better off for you sticking it. You're the only one, like I said, who knows where that fistula is, right. how it works, how it behaves. So, you know, having random people stick you all the time is not always, you know, the best thing for your fistula. Sometimes if you have no alternative, that's okay. But right. don't ever let fear of cannulation stop you from doing what you want because you can overcome it. And I, I just want to say that I think that really, and thank you for that, is that it is really one of the issues that most people have with trying to go home and, you know, and it's the cannulation. Cannulating is, you know, um, very interesting. So you don't have a tunnel though. You didn't do the tunnel procedure to Sorry, use the what? black needles, the tunnel, you know, you, oh, the, the you know, I tried the, the buttonhole and to be honest, buttonhole. it was more frustrating. Um, mm -hmm. I've do, done rope ladder for the majority of the eight years. And okay. I actually, it's very hard to find my fistula. I mean, it's, it's very small pronounced vein now, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't have uh, large aneurysms or big bumps, uh, you right. know, and, and all of that I think comes with proper care and maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, know, sure. The more that, that patients learn and know and have support for their lifeline, um, it's critical. And, and just as a matter of inspiration, we had a board member um, who had had most of his fingers amputated. He still self-cannulated himself. Um, and we have actually had blind people who can mm -hmm. self-cannulate because you do it by feel. Right. I don't necessarily right. even have to look anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's, you can overcome it, you know, and I literally say anybody can overcome it. Wow, thank you. That's fantastic. Um, it's good to know about that. And for other folks who didn't realize the buttonhole is, you know, one of the things that they use too that actually will give you some ease with um, that the, the cannulation. Um, I didn't get a chance to do that, but I was that was where I was going if I had to go to home. <laughs> do buttonholes love them? I mm -hmm, mean, right. that's great. But if they don't work for you, don't be afraid because the difference between a buttonhole needle and a sharp needle is minuscule. I, I don't feel a sharp any. In fact, buttonholes hurt worse for me than than sharps ever have. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, um, and just one more thing, very quickly. Um, you kind of went through all of. Do you? There's uh, a couple oh. of questions. There's a couple oh. questions in the chat. Can you okay. see the chat? Um. Yes. Where, where did we well, I could I could ask one of Diane. Um, uh, was your company accommodating doing peritoneal dialysis? Oops, you, you're on you mute. Muted. I'm you're muted. muted, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other question was as well. She's figuring out how to unmute. Is how do you explain dialysis to your friends and family? I don't. 
(laughs) (laughs) You know, I mean, one of the things that happened when I first started, I had had friends for 10 years that we met every month for dinner and, you know, great friends. And unfortunately, the night I was supposed to host the dinner, I had to go to the hospital to crash into dialysis. And I sent out an email apologizing and said, I truly don't know what's going to happen. Never heard from any of them again. I'm not kidding. Five different couples, not once. But over time, I've developed a whole new group of friends who are supportive, many through the dialysis community, um, mm-hmm. and who obviously we can communicate, you know, talk about our, our issues. Um, but it's it's not a focus of my life. So, you know, I don't talk to my family about it. But if I travel with my grandkids, they know that I bring along my machine. Um, you know, they're used to it, they'll help, you know, as needed, but I don't involve them. Um, you know, it's just something that I do the same way a diabetic has to do their their tests and their their uh, insulin. Uh, so I, I don't make a point of it. Yeah, I make it I, it's my other job. <laughs> it's my part time job that I have to go to three times a week. Mm-hmm. And Lori, what was the question to Diana? about her work being accommodated yeah um i i have to say i'm very very blessed my boss has been nothing but accommodating and my co-workers the same um i think one of the biggest compliments that i've gotten since i started this journey with pd is you don't look sick you don't act sick and i mean to me that means that i'm doing something right and the pd is working Mm -hmm. not that that when you have kidney disease, you look or act sick. I don't know what they think I should look like. But, right, but I get that you know, all the time too. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm figuring that the day that I'm really sick, you'll see it. But yeah. I, I don't want to think of myself as a sick person. So right. I very rarely call out. There have been times when I have had to say, listen, I'm not feeling well this morning. You know, maybe I'll take four hours or something. And, and, you know, he's like, don't worry about it. And then, you know, after two hours, I feel better, you know, and it, it, a lot of times it doesn't have to do with PD. I suffer from migraines. And so if I have had a restless night or I'm sleepless, it affects migraines or my head, my headache. So, so, and he's always like accommodating, like I said, my coworkers, like anything we can do for you. So, you know, they recognize that I'm, I don't want to be treated differently, but sometimes I can't give a hundred percent. So. That's great. I mean, I went through the same thing. I didn't have any issues. I was lucky too. And I know some people who do, and um, it certainly is, um, it's always good to have that. That's another part of the the support system that makes you feel better and keeps you feeling better when you actually have that kind of support coming from your peers. And I want to say the same with um, that. I wasn't a big person to talk about my dialysis either. Um, Later on, I became a little more when we were actually, um, when I was working with other uh, patients and doing a lot of work with RSN and with other organizations to just actually talk to family members so that, you know, they understood without the fear and some of the other things that happen when you are in, in, with families. And I thought that was little, that would help them to understand exactly what their family, their family member was going through because most of the time they don't get any information and they only have the hearsay in the midst and all the other things about what's happening with their family member. And it's much better for them and for you to give them um, any information about how you're feeling and what you're going through and let them and, and I think that kind of keeps them out of your out of your business so to speak <laughs> so I think that's a great idea yeah. Are there any more yeah. questions? okay Diane well you have something else no I, I saw another question come up about something about active how yeah. active can you be on peritoneal dialysis is that another question okay. you go ahead and ask it yeah, um, I, the, I, I, I walk, um, I'm not a runner. I walk, um, I, I um, take in Dina's class, the one that did the stretching. I do that twice a week. I like to do yoga. Um, if the gyms, if I felt safer, safer at my gyms, I would be going there, but I'm still not comfortable going there. But I can do it online at home. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing that I haven't tried is swimming. And that's probably because i um, like you know where would I swim maybe at the Y or at the gym and you're not sure how clean the water is and I just don't want to go there um you might be better off going in an ocean like if you went to an island and Mm. the salt water than you would being in a pool Mm. so that's the only I I mean I love to swim but that's the one thing that I haven't tried doing since I'm fit to know did you do that on did you swim at all when you were on 
I, I didn't, no, I no. did not. Um, mm -hmm. And there were different things about swimming too. And it, it was actually the opposite that you should go into a pool as opposed to going to the ocean. Right. <laughs> so, I'm not, you know. It, it, so it's it, like, yeah, yeah. But swimming yeah. in me right now, it's okay. It wasn't, <laughs> like, it wasn't a I, priority. I, 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 I don't <laughs> live in a place where there's a lot of swimming happening anyway. Right. But, <laughs> well, I know like, you know, any kind of water any, uh, activity is very good or, you know, aerobics and everything. But it's just at this time of my life, it's just better that I don't. Yeah. And I just want to add to you that it's good to be active. It's good to try and stay as active as you can as, as long as you feel well doing it and that you're not hurting yourself because it also helps. What helped me was actually doing the actually traveling and working and doing the things that I did. So again, as someone said earlier, I don't have to, I'm not thinking about it all the time. Right. Okay. Wasn't thinking about so it. I just want to throw in here that don't overlook the um, option of, of asking your doctor, your team to prescribe physical therapy and op, uh, or op, occupational therapy. It's mm -hmm. really important and it's underused um, mm -hmm. and Medicare does cover this. So early on when I felt my muscles wasting, you know, I, I start, you know, you're overwhelmed when you first start, I did ask, I took physical therapy uh, and I opted to do it in the pool since obviously mm -hmm. I, you know, have a fistula. Mm -hmm. So it was really great. I started out where I could barely walk down the hall and I finished, you know, very active. I, when I started my heavy travel schedule with work, I kind of dropped it. But late last year or so, what I did was I purchased one of those um, inflatable hot tubs and used all the exercises that I learned in physical therapy and do that in a, a daily routine in my hot tub. And it has just been amazing because that's the kind of exercise that I like. It's soothing. I'm not, I don't hurt. I don't feel bad. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of stretching, but it's helped immensely. So mm -hmm. all I'm just saying is find your happy place. Like you said, you walk, you can use stationary exercise uh, during dialysis. They, they've done a lot of studies on that. So, but just yeah. stay active. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there is a question um, that I'm seeing a couple of things is, is what motivates people, uh, especially, um, you know, during difficult days, and what inspires you. We also have a couple, maybe you can incorporate in your answers. Uh, do you have any weird cravings? Um, that was, I think, interesting question. And then, you know, we have a participant, his name is Nick. And he made a comment, and I relate to it, but he said, I would rather die than do dialysis. Me too. I, I have said that too. Um, but if you want to yeah. elaborate, because it's, it's a normal feeling. Mm -hmm. So I have to, I tried to address Nick earlier. I said, you know, because that I had spent 20 years of CKD avoiding dialysis, and I had no intention of starting. The only reason that I crashed into dialysis and didn't go to hospice was because I was taking care of my mom with dementia and literally didn't have that option to die. So the doctor said, you're gonna do home dialysis. I said, yeah, right. But my intention was to take care of my mom and call home hospice. I started to feel better. That was eight years ago. So I can't call hospice if I'm living my best life. I actually healthier than I was during CKD. I feel better and more active. I'm working again, you know, at 70, I have my dream job. So yeah, I, I totally understand where Nick's at. I really do. And I'm not going to talk anyone out of that option because I was there. Um, and it may be the best option if you choose that. Make sure you're educated in all of the options. Make sure that you know what is your best option. So, you know, and- And, and it is an option. It is. You know, so, most the most time it's not it's not spoken about, but it actually is an option. But, but I do. I'm, I'm with you um, about that. It's that it certainly is. You know, everyone thought it and I'm not and probably everyone who has to go through this has thought that, you know, I you know, I again <clears throat> was lucky. I walked in, um, I took, I was two years before I actually had to go on dialysis. I actually did not crash. Um, and so, but I was actually having had an opportunity to go to a dialysis center and I walked in there and I went, oh no. <laughs> I said, is there something else I can do? And every time I tell that story, people say, really, you were, you thought about that? And I said, yeah, I said, there has to be something else other than this. And sit, watching people sitting in those chairs. And so my PTSD I, moment. 
Yeah, and I was very lucky to have went to a facility at that time who was doing peritoneal because they weren't doing it in all facilities. And that was the reason why I started on PD and I did not right, crash right into um, um, that, um, um, in center hemo. And so, um, but I think it's what we're talking about here is that people need to understand their options and know their options and that they are out there and they're available for them. Absolutely. That's one of my biggest things is making is I see a lot of patients weren't given options. I personally wasn't given any options. They put me on hemodialysis and didn't tell me anything about it for days mm. while I was in the hospital. I had to write a letter and call membership services to get any information. And they were like, we didn't give you our welcome to dialysis back. And I'm like, would I be on the phone asking you for it? If you give uh, it to me? <laughs> and they sent it to me. And I started reading. Uh, and there's the little book called What to Do When Your Kidneys Fail. And that was a great resource for me at the beginning of it. And it's been 23 years. I haven't missed the treatment unless I was in the hospital under doctor's care. Mm. And I, I come I come every time I'm supposed to be here. I rearranged my life. I've been on vacations and rearranged my life to do vacations, to do dialysis while I'm on vacation. Mm -hmm. But I do know that um, there's going to come a time when I want to stop. And I told my husband, when I want to stop, I'm going to stop. You know, but the quality of life, I think you have to look at your quantity versus quality of life. You have to have, like next she said, you have to have a good life to continue on dialysis, to want to be a part of this. <clears throat> this dialysis is not a walk in the park. Um, what I was going to say is, um, as far as, I, I tried to talk my doctor out of, I'm like, let me go as long as I can before you put me on dialysis, because I know it's going to be like, I'll be chained to this thing, you know, every night. And my social life, everything will just go down the tubes. And, you know, I'll be out for dinner and oh, got to go home to plug in, you know, it was never going to be part of my life. So actually, unfortunately, my doctor passed away and I didn't see anybody, no nephrologist, nothing. I went for my do uh, family doctor for a checkup and she said, Diana, you are too sick to not be under the care of a nephrologist. So she got me in because it's hard to get an appointment, you know, being a specialist. She mm. got me in and the woman said, we're making your appointment now for to have the catheter because I was so bad. You don't feel sick. So you convince yourself you're not sick. Right. And unfortunately with kidneys, by the time you, you're at death's door, you're in the hospital and they're putting the tube down here right. because they have to get yep. you emergency dialysis. And that's not how I wanted to wind <laughs> up. So I figured, like she said, quality. Okay. I don't really yeah. like flossing my teeth either, but I do that. every. <laughs> night, so, you know, I just, it's, it's now part of my life. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Share, well, my mom used mental. to say, only floss the teeth you want to keep. So I guess only, <laughs> only dialysize the kidney you want to keep functioning, right? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I knew there was a reason why I liked you, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's you wonderful. know, in answer to the, what motive I use us on a daily basis, I always tell people that you have to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Um, and I don't care what age you are, whether you are 20, and, you know, and going to school, or I'm supposed to be retired, I would go bonkers if I didn't have anything to do. I am so grateful that this is my last stand in advocacy. Um, and that I have really the job of my dreams at 70. So whatever it is, whether it's get, gardening in the morning, taking a walk, taking care of grandkids, children, family, school, work, find whatever it is, you know, uh, Catherine, you write books. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, it ha you have to, and that is irrespective of dialysis. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. If you have that reason to get out of bed in the morning, then dialysis is just what you do to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What makes you happy? Yep. What makes you happy? Um, so any more, any more questions? I'm, I looked in here. Wait, let's see. Uh, did you all find that you had to advocate and make your decisions and choices versus expecting the doctor to tell you what you had to do? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I had a couple of I had a, I had a couple of doctors at the beginning of my adventure who decided they wanted to play guinea pig with them, and I stopped them. Mm. And I said, "No, 
these are not the things. They called my husband in for a family meeting and tried to convince us to do some things that I was not going to do. And so I fired doctors and got new doctors and they kicked me out of the hospital like the very next day because I was not cooperating with them. But they never gave me reason to cooperate. I'm a reasonable person. If you give me information and you tell me the things that I need to know, I can be, make reasonable decisions, but they weren't giving me information. Right. So always ask questions, get the information that you need, and don't stop asking questions until you get what you need, until you get some knowledge, because I wouldn't let them do a fistula until I'd been out of a hospital for at least a month or two and could make decisions without being so sick. I have to say the same thing. Um, you know, ask questions. There's, you, uh, you know, we, we live in a country where um, the doctor is supposedly always right. Um, and I think we really need to remember that this is us we're talking about. You're talking about yourself. And, you know, to find out information is the key. Um, yep. it's the key to keeping, uh, keeping yourselves healthy. Find out as much information as you can. Um, Again, you know, don't rely on someone else giving you answers about anything to do with you and your health and especially with kidney disease. Um, you know, in the beginning, I knew nothing. And I was very, again, very, very lucky to find some people who actually have, have pushed me in the right direction and gave me the information mm -hmm. and knowledge that I needed to keep myself alive. And that's really what it is about. It's about you keeping yourself alive. You can't rely on anyone else to keep you alive. And I also learned to ask questions early on. Um, and it, a lot of times it was met with resentment. Um, my mm -hmm. clinic actually labeled me a troublemaker. But the ironic thing is that I am actually one of the most healthy patients you'll see. My labs are consistently perfect. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I tell my doctor, and fortunately, we, my doctor and I work as a team. And I tell him how I'm changing my medications based on my labs. I, I, it, the most important thing is to take your labs, not just the happy face, but read every detail and then know where you feel good Absolutely. and aim for that level because your anemia may be better at 10 than mine is at 11.5. But, you know, if I'm at 10 on hemoglobin, I don't function. Everybody needs to know what works for them. Ask those questions, educate yourself, and don't be afraid, you know, to be that troublemaker because it's your life. Yeah. Your life depends on it. Nobody else, they don't, you know, they haven't been on dialysis. They don't understand what's happening to your body. And so you need to be in tune with that. Um, and if you can do that, you're going to live your best life. I can promise you. Yes. Hey. I, I think they had something about cravings. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm going to say that my cravings are no different. I will crave chocolate and I will allow myself a little bit. Not, not as much as Catherine. I commend you that you can just stop at two a day. I, I don't know <laughs> if I could. So, uh, but I do have one splurge day a week. Where if I want Rita's, I'll go out and get Rita's. If I want a candy bar, I'll go to candy bar. I just try to never have it in the house because I know that then I won't stick to my diet the rest of the week. But, you know, I mean, let's just say if this is the best life I'm going to have, I don't want it to be like, oh, and I didn't have that, those Reese's peanut butter cups when I showed up, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, if I'm going to do it, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to say, hey, you know, once a week have a little something sure. reward yourself you know for staying on the path and that's that's the act and that's why you watch your your labs and you know exactly what it is and what you can do when you can do those little cheats once in a while yeah. my craving was cheese because i love cheese i oh, always yeah. love cheese and i was telling doctors i will not give up cheese i'm like that little boy at christmas they gave me cheese so um <laughs> well you're still better than i am because i refuse to give up my glass of wine <laughs> <laughs> And when I was when I was transplanted, I was, I craved cashews like crazy, and I and I got a letter from the, the the donor's family, and I asked them about it, and they said he loved cashews. Oh. So all of a sudden, I'm, I'm like, I don't know if this is true or not, but I, I was craving cashews. I and I still love cashews. I well, before I didn't care, but I mean, I left, literally, I um, tasted them in my mouth. Yeah. And I went and got some cashews, and it, but anyway. That could be, you know, just me. <laughs> so, 
So I've heard that before that people get cravings from their donor. Your donor. So I love it, the smell of pet toys and a bookstore. I like to just stand and stand, walk into a bookstore and go, mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> and the smell yeah. just reaches into me and says, yes, you're in the place you belong. Yeah. And then Pet Boys, for some reason, walking into Pet Boys is a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very weird thing. Sometimes I'll go down there just to smell the store. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Aaron, there is a question about your cycler big and bulky and... Um, you know, I was on PD for nine years and I, um, I traveled with it. I would go back to manual when I went hiking, mm -hmm. I went swimming, I did everything, um, uh, for nine years. And it was, it was, uh, my preferred d treatment option after transplant was mm -hmm. peritoneal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it really did help me because my vascular wasn't as healthy as many, um, being a kid who was poked and prodded so much, right. but, um, you know, I know a lot of people who travel with their cycler. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't. Like mine actually machine. Mine was actually big, and there at that point too, I didn't. They would only allow you to do manuals because you really couldn't carry it. Um, I didn't have that. It was huge. I can't even remember what the name of it was, but um, it was a. It was my cycler was quite big because I did overnight, so it was. Um, it was a really. And I usually, when I traveled, I did manual. So I well, find like this, the size of a, like consider it like a small copier or fax machine. It's very right. compact. No, they're yeah. just as very sensitive. Ones now are, so are you have fantastic. to be careful. Yeah, I I, th those weren't pounds. around, I think, when I started. Yeah. Thinking, so yeah. Next stage weighs about 100 pounds and I've traveled thousands, thousands of miles with it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you it's easy. Mm -hmm. But with a good planning, um, you know, and a lot of cash for tips, because I, again, travel solo as well, um, I, I can do it. And I'll be going to Hawaii this Christmas. Um, you know, I travel before COVID. I was traveling two weeks out of every month. And that our, the next stage machine is a workhorse. So that sucker, it goes in a heavy uh, steel case, mm -hmm. weighs 100 pounds. It goes down the air conveyor belt. It gets kicked around, thrown into the cabin of the plane. It has never broken on a trip, thousands and thousands of miles. Mm -hmm. um, and like PD, I get the, the solution is shipped to my location. Um, you can, if you're traveling abroad or to Mexico, uh, a lot of our travelers, and, and if you go to our website, you'll see a lot of tips for travel on, on dialysis. Um, they'll, they know how to take the PD solution in the uh, hemodialysate solution for travel. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it is doable. And, you know, we have many, many patients who've gone to Australia, Italy, Britain, Germany, the islands, cruises. We've all done cruises. Um, yeah. So many options. So, again, don't let the thought of, of being on dialysis limit you. Right. I'm going to turn it over to Cher so she can close it out. But I just wanted to say um, so she can do the raffle. Uh, but also, I just wanted to say, and this is not a formal study, it's just 35 years of observation. The people that participate at this meeting are lo lo more likely to get transplanted and oh, yeah. live long. And it's because we're knowledgeable and advocate for ourselves. So just go out, seek information and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, be proactive and you will have a five decade experience like I did with this illness and maybe seven or eight. That's what I'm shooting for. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you. Thank Super. you. Super. Thank you, panelists. And thank you, Aaron. Uh, really spectacular, wonderful feedback in the chat. If you haven't read it, you should and give yourself a big pat on the back. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Aaron, you did a wonderful job. All the thank panelists, you, you did as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are going to do a raffle. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.